Okay, and we'll conclude the session with uh, two presentations from postdocs in Mike Rainier's group at University of Washington. First up, we have uh, Matthew Childers. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I'm a postdoc at, in Mike's lab, um, and we do a lot of sort of multi-scale modeling. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some computational models that, that I work on in the lab, and I work really closely with a lot of experimentalists. Um, so we, there's a lot of back and forth in our lab over these models and experiments. Um, so, and we work a lot with muscle. Um, so the major proteins that we have in muscle that we are concerned about are myosin and actin. Uh, these two proteins uh, generate force um, through concerted intermolecular intermolecular interactions and structural changes uh, that are really highly regulated. Um, this process, let's see, do I have a laser pointer? Oh, if we turn it on. Oh, that's okay. Um, so I, I've drawn up here a, a cartoon of, of what we call the cross-bridge cycle where actin and myosin interact with one another, undergo this event known as the power stroke, um, which generates force, um, and then the system undergoes a, a relaxation event. Um, so different structural perturbations, uh, such as mutations, can pathologically alter either the thermodynamic stability uh, of different conformations of actin and myosin within this cycle, uh, these structural perturbations can also modulate the kinetics of, of transitions between different states in the cycle. Um, and so as a structural biologist myself, um, my job and a lot of the focus of my research is to understand how these structural changes at this very small, very fundamental biological scale ultimately lead to diseases that manifest um, in, in cells, tissues, and even organs. Um, so traditional structural biology techniques like X-ray crystallography have provided a lot of insight into these protein conformations in the bottom right hand corner. Um, there's a cryo-EM structure of an actomycin complex. Uh, but structures like this are a little bit misleading because they are static representations of an inherently dynamic system. Um, so in my work, I use a technique called molecular dynamic simulations, where we actually simulate the time-dependent motions of different atomic systems. Um, so this is a physics-based computational model where we take some protein or atomic system, um, shove it in the computer, and simulate its dynamics over time. And like I said, I work uh, really closely with a lot of experimentalists in the lab, so the goals of my research are to really understand um, how do changes at the protein structural level translate to changes that are observed in the various experiments that we run. And so today I'm going to tell you, give you a, a sort of a short story of, of one of these um, structural studies we've done. Um, I'll quickly review the structure of myosin here. Um, so this is our myosin motor protein. Um, I think of it as shaped kind of like a crab claw, if you look at it. Uh, on the left-hand side is the actin binding cleft. This is the part of myosin that interacts with actin. It's formed by the upper and lower 50 kilodalton domains. If we slide on to uh, your left, um, oh, sorry, your right, uh, in the center of the protein is the nucleotide binding pocket. This is where myosin binds ATP, which is sort of its fuel source. Um, and sort of moving on over even more um, is the tail region of myosin. Um, the tail undergoes a pretty large, um, large amplitude structural change during force generation. Um, today I'm going to talk about a, a few different residues in myosin. One that I want to point out is alanine 222. Um, pointing out on the structure there and showing some of the atoms for that residue in red. Um, this residue is mutated, um, so we're going to pay a lot of attention to that. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about two different structural perturbations that um, we've studied in myosin, and we've done simulations of both of these structural perturbations. The first is this alanine 223 to threonine mutation. Um, the simulations I'm going to show today have been done in a scallop myosin, and so the mutation is alanine 222. Uh, this mutation is associated with dilated cardiomyopathy, and experimentally we know that this reduces the affinity of actin for myosin um, from stop flow experiments. 
Uh, the second structural change I'm going to talk about is swapping out the nucleotide that myosin uses as fuel. So myosin is a promiscuous enzyme and it can use a lot of different nucleotides. Um, and the one we're going to talk about today is called deoxy-ATP, which is hydrolyzed to deoxy-ADP in fuel generation. A lot of work from uh, the Rainier lab has shown that um, this small molecule really sort of en enhances myosin activity um, when it's used as a fuel source. So to give you an idea of what I do, I'm going to show you some movies of simulations that I have run. Oops. Let's see. So um, we're going to watch a movie of a scallop myosin in the pre-power stroke conformation. Um, so this is where ADP, phosphate, and magnesium are in the binding pocket. This first movie on the left is the wild type simulation. Um, so this is sort of real-time dynamics of myosin. Um, I'm focusing here on the nucleotide binding pocket. Um, the atoms in spheres are the ADP. Um, and then just to the left of that are, are atoms represented as sticks. Um, this is a region of myosin known as switch one. And it's involved in structural communication between the nucleotide binding pocket and the actin binding surface. Uh, I spoke a little faster in the movie. So all the, uh, the shaded regions there are atoms that are involved in interactions uh, with actin. Um, so these molecular simulations are sort of a computational microscope that let us really see proteins and atomic systems in action. Um, so now we'll watch another movie in which I've replaced ADP with a deoxy-ADP in the nucleotide binding pocket. And what I hope you can appreciate is that the deoxynucleotide uh, is a bit more dynamic and it changes its conformation a bit more. And here in a second, this nucleotide is going to transition over and start right there. So it starts interacting with residues in switch one more than ADP does. This initiates a series of structural changes that sort of propagate through myosin and ultimately affect the structure of the upper 50 kilodalton domain. So I'm going to back up the movie. Oh, I can't back up the movie. Uh, we'll go through it again. Um, so it happens a little quickly towards the end of the movie, but once we get moving towards the looking at those residues involved in the actin binding surface. Um, there's a blob on the left hand side of the movie. Let's see if I can point it out with my Yeah, so here in the left you'll see a blob sort of come down right there and start integrating it with this actin binding surface. Um, so these Molecular simulations really allow us to compare the dynamics between um, different protein systems. It lets us see how introducing a structural change into a protein can, can modify the protein's dynamics um, and physical properties. Um, we saw sort of a similar change with uh, the mutation. Um, I'll sort of summarize that quickly. When we mutated alanine to threonine, um, um, uh, threonine is a much bulkier residue than alanine, and so it occupies sort of a bigger space, and it required that a lot of these um, residues and regions of myosin around the nucleotide binding pocket to change their conformation. Um, so I'll kind of walk through some structural changes that we observed here. Um, first, we, we quantified the interactions between switch one and the nucleotide. So as I said, switch one is this part of myosin that communicates to the actin binding surface. Um, all the results I'm going to show are going to have the wild type ADP phosphate results in black, the deoxy ADP phosphates in blue, and the mutant um, results in this uh, green color. And we see that the deoxy ADP really increased interactions between myosin and switch one, um, whereas the mutation really decreased um, interactions between switch one and the nucleotide. We can look at other regions of myosin similarly. Uh, these histograms are showing you the surface area of all the residues involved in actin binding. And we see that when we replace the nucleotide with deoxy ADP phosphate, we get some modest increases in the surface area of the actin binding residues. Um, and sort of on the opposite end of the spectrum, when we mutated this alanine to a threonine, we saw a pretty dramatic decrease um, in the actin binding surface area. So we started to build sort of a structural hypothesis of what's going on with this, um, this system um, um, based on the results we see here. And I'm going to 
move through a few slides. Um, so we saw that as you change the contents of the nucleotide binding pocket, whether that's through changing the nucleotide or making a mutation, you can affect the, the structure of the actin binding surface. Um, so we turn to our friends here at the McCullough Lab, um, Abby and Marcus, um, to do some Brownian dynamic simulation. So we're sort of moving up a scale here. And we wanted to see how changes in the actin binding surface area affected association of actin myosin um, using these brown dye simulations here. Um, what we saw, um, which is sort of plotted in this graph here, is that as you mute, uh, change the nucleotide to deoxyADP and increased actin binding surface area, you had an increased association rate between actin and myosin at large reaction distances. Whereas if you decreased the actin binding surface area with a mutation, you decreased the association rate. Um, so we know experimentally that this mutation is leading to a decreased affinity of actin for myosin, and so our molecular simulations are allowing us to hypothesize that this decrease in um, actomyosin affinity is related to structural changes at the actin binding surface. We also know that we have a small molecule that can have the opposite effect on the system. So we hypothesize that, well, maybe if we introduced our deoxy ATP nucleotide into a mutant system, that it could therapeutically rescue myosin's function. So we repeated all of our simulations here, and that is, in fact, what we saw. Um, so now the results in a light blue, um, which are maybe not super distinct on this projector, um, we saw that, that when we had a mutant myosin with a deoxy ADP nucleotide in the pocket, we had increased interactions with switch two, an increased actin binding surface area, and in brown dye simulations, we saw a um, wild type like restoration of the actomyosin association rate. Um, so, this study is an example of how we've used MD simulations to understand, um, to explain or develop a molecular me mechanism for results that have been seen in the lab. Um, it's also allowed us to make predictions about things that we can do. Um, so, based off these results, we're actually starting to run some new experiments where we're going to test out directly the ability of this alternate nucleotide to um, recover actomycin function with this mutation. Um, so just to save on time, I'll sort of skip to the end here and thank um, a lot of the people who have contributed to this work, all the members of the Rainier Lab, um, folks here from UCSD. Um, a lot of these uh, simulations have been made possible through um, UW Center for Translational Muscle Research. So at the CTMR, we've developed a, quite a few molecular simulations for different muscle proteins, actin myosin, troponin complex, things like that. Um, so yeah, that's sort of a short story I have for you. Um, coming up next, Sage is going to talk about uh, maybe some other models that we can do that we do down at UW, and maybe show a few other um, structural models as well. So I think I have a few minutes for some questions. Cool. Sage, why don't you come and get set up while um, Matthew takes questions? Yeah, Joseph. Yeah, great question. So we do have, uh, there are multiple crystal structures of myosin and multiple structural states. So are you asking why we chose that structural state or that particular, that particular PDB file? So when um, we started running these simulations, um, we actually used the scallop system because there were PDB structures of myosin in quite a few of the chemomechanical states available. Um, so we used, so that's why we went with the scallop model. It's a high resolution structure. It's reasonably close to a human myosin II structure. Um, and we knew the structure in multiple states. And right now, um, since that time, a lot of bovine cardiac myosin structures have come out, as well as several human structures. And so we've sort of progressed our models through multiple species. Cool. Well, thank you guys for your attention there. Awesome. And last but very not least, we have Sage, um, also from uh, Mike's group. Yep. All right. Thanks, Nate. Um, 
So today I'm going to share with you about a couple of different methods that we've used for multi-scale modeling of muscle. And as you can tell, um, I like a little bit of wordplay. So the title of today's, or my talk today, is Multi-Scale Modeling of Muscle, Monte Carlo Models of Muscle's Molecular Machinery, Machine Learning, and Molecular Dynamics. And one of the things that I love about muscle is that it is inherently a multi-scale um, process by which muscle contracts. So as Matt highlighted, individual molecular motors are actually generating the power um, that um, causes muscle to contract at the whole cell and organ scale. I want to walk you through a little bit of the geometry of muscle um, at the sarcomere scale in particular. So muscle cells contain bundles of contractile machinery called myofibrils that run from one end of the cell to the other. And these contain sarcomeres, which are hitched together like the cars of a train, and they run axially along the length of the cell. The sarcomere contracts when myosin molecular motors, which branch off of these thick filaments that I've shown here in red, um, bind to the neighboring actin-containing thin filaments and move them in towards the center of the sarcomere. Um, so you start with a long sarcomere, and it gets contracted down into a shortened state. So this is the sliding filament hypothesis that many of you learned in your undergraduate courses. Um, so Matt already did some really beautiful work um, talking about the molecular detail of the actomycin interaction. But there's one thing I wanted to highlight. The interaction is actually probabilistic. So myosin binding to actin depends on the distance between a motor molecule and a prospective binding site. There's one other piece of this puzzle that I wanted to point out. Your muscles are not always contracting. This is actually regulated. So nervous activation triggers the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it interacts with proteins on the thin filament, namely troponin and tropomyosin, and causes them to slide away from prospective actin binding sites. Um, so I'm showing a cartoon from a paper by Yamada et al. Um, but this paper also has really beautiful structural images if you're curious to look at those. So with that background in mind, I want to talk about some research that we currently have submitted. Um, this paper is titled Machine Learning Meets Monte Carlo Methods for Models of Muscles Molecular Machinery to Classify Mutations. And I want to acknowledge all of the co-authors on this work, but in particular, Anthony Asensio, who is now a grad student in Micronear's group, and he really owned this project as a first author. Okay. As you can tell, we are super interested in how small changes like mutations can um, feed up into a larger scale and cause whole organ scale diseases. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which you've heard about today, is an example of one such process. And in particular, the model I'm going to tell you about focuses in at the half sarcomere scale. And we hope to look at how a mutation can perturb function at this scale in particular. The model that we're dealing with links probabilistically interacting motors and binding sites in an elastic network of proteins or myofilaments. So the thick filament can stretch and the thin filament can stretch as myosin molecular motors bind to the thin filament and exert forces. We're looking at a network of four thick filaments and eight thin filaments and we give this network periodic boundary conditions. So in addition to those mechanics, we also need some rate kinetics describing the activation of the thin filament, so the binding of calcium to troponin and the movement of troponin and tropomyosin away from prospective binding sites. And then we also allow the motor molecules to interact probabilistically, and this is that Monte Carlo bit where we're rolling dices to see if we hit a probable um, interaction. And that interaction, as I mentioned before, depends on the distance between the myosin motor and a prospective binding site. So we've got rate constants, and we have mechanical constants. And then to put this puzzle together, we need one other thing. And that is a calcium trace. So for this project, we used a calcium trace from adult cardiomyocytes that was measured using a myofilament localized sensor by Sparrow et al. 
Um, this is an example of a calcium trace from their paper, but importantly, we're only looking at one pulse of calcium because we're only seeking to measure one twitch of a half sarcomere. This is an example of some of our results. So I've shown here calcium, the calcium trace in the blue dashed line and the twitch force trace with a black solid line. And as you can see, there's a lot of noise in that axial force. And that actually makes sense because this is a probabilistic model excuse me, probabilistic model. So the rest of the twitches I'm going to show you are actually averaging over many twitches so that we can smooth them out and see trends, but bear in the back of your head that each individual twitch is actually very noisy. So here are some examples of what happens when we start to perturb rates, and we perturbed rates to correspond to mutations that cause disease. I'm not going to go into depth on these right now because of time, um, but the L48Q mutations, oh, you can see my mouse. Great. So these L48Q mutations um, are implicated in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this 50% D65A mutation is implicated in um, DCM or a lack of troponin being able to interact with calcium. Our black line, which is here, is our control or our wild type twitch. And then we have this gain of function in blue, which is a decreased rate of myosin motor detachment. And as you can see, there are some visually apparent differences in the timing and magnitude of force. And one of the questions we asked in this paper is can we systematically identify underlying perturbations, so these mechanistic um, modes that we um, applied in our model using the twitch force that we have as an output. And there are two things I'd like to highlight about why this computational model was really important. Because it's spatially explicit, we're able to have variable penetrance of the mutated protein, as evidenced with the L48Q. And also, with a computational model, you can generate a ton of data. So this is a great system for machine learning, and I'll share a little bit of that. There are some conventional metrics we use to um, classify twitches, peak force, activation time, relaxation time, and twitch tension index. Twitch tension index is a newer one, um, and it looks at integrating the twitch force over time. And it can be really useful for identifying twitches that are implicated in DCM or HCM. But all of the metrics that I just mentioned don't really take into account the full time course of the twitch. So we asked if twitch timing might, under, might help to reveal underlying perturbation. Um, so I want to give you some intuition for this problem. We subtracted from each of these twitches the um, mean wild type twitch, and you can see that in particular, for example, for L48Q mutations, there is an increase of force early and an increase of force late, so a more rapid activation and a slower relaxation. So how can we simply describe these differences, especially if we want to use them for machine learning? Um, I'm not gonna dive too deeply into SVD, um, but if you don't know about it, this is a really great YouTube video. You should take a picture of it. Uh, but we use the SVD to identify components that best describe our data set, and the SVD ranks them in order so that you can identify which are most important. And the eigenvalues in the sigma matrix are the ones in particular that tell us about which are most important. So here I'm showing the normalized eigenvalues for our um, big matrix of twitches. And it's a little hard to see the dot, perhaps, but our first eigenvalue is close to 1, and the rest are very close to 0. So we know that first one's super important. And then the second one here in orange is also pretty important. And so I'm showing you those um, eigen components here. And we can linearly sum these to reasonably reconstitute each of the twitches that we generated with our model. And then if we project each individual twitch onto those components, we're able to um, do PCA analysis. 
and we see some really nice clustering in our data set. So this indicates that it is a good descriptor of variation in the twitches. Um, using all these features, we trained a machine learning model to classify underlying perturbation. The machine learning model we used is XGBoost. I again welcome you to take a picture of this slide. If you're curious about XGBoost, the tutorial at the bottom is awesome. It's a really intuitive machine learning model for classification problems. Um, but the summary of what we found is that yes, we can classify underlying perturbation from twitches. And it turns out that the features that you use to classify twitches matter. Um, and we found that using our projections onto principal components along with the twitch tension index helped us to build the most accurate classifier. Um, and interestingly, it was even better than the model that we trained that had access to the full twitch time course and twitch tension index alone. And to me, this is one of the most surprising results of this work. And it indicates that a little bit of feature engineering goes a long way. One other thing that I found really interesting about this work is when we looked at the confusion matrix, which shows the true value of a twitch, so the true class or true perturbation type, um, and then our model's prediction on the x-axis, we had a fair number of off-diagonal misclassifications for L48Q. And so what I learned from this is that these misclassifications were not so much a um, miss on the type of perturbation, but actually a miss of the extent of perturbation. So we were misidentifying the penetrance. All right, so a few conclusions. First, the most exciting one is, yeah, it's possible to build a classifier um, of underlying perturbation type given a data set of um, twitches. And then we learned that twitch timing echoes underlying perturbation type, and so it can be useful for training our classifier. And finally, we learned that a little bit of feature engineering can be really helpful in making an effective classifier. Um, I want to just give a peek into what is happening next. So I will be working um, on a project that Matt and Travis wrote a pilot grant for to connect the multi-filament spatially explicit model I just shared about with the molecular dynamic scale models that Matt was sharing about. We want to look at how uh, mutations can alter kinetics and feed those results into the multi-filament model. And we also want to look at how forces at the scale of interacting filaments affect uh, molecular scale function. So with that, thank you um, to the HAM Lab, to good funders, and I'll take any questions. Do you have any questions from the audience? Yeah, Marcus. Yeah, that is a super interesting quest question. Um, so for the purposes of this paper, it was totally random, but we do have control over that. So you could, in this model, you could have more localized, and Mike has things to say about that, and a paper on it. Yeah, please do. 
good point. I think I, I exceeded time. Well, let's uh, give Sage another round of applause. Thank you, everybody. I um, um, appreciate you staying and uh, watching our afternoon speakers. And let's give everybody a big hand again. Thank you so much for all the trainees, for all their hard work, getting the symposium ready and doing such a good job today. Thank you. And bringing the posters and everything. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Bianca, would you stand up and remind us what your uh, speech was today, what your presentation was? Characterizing a response to injury okay. in a pregnant model. Okay. And um, Alex? Uh, it was the characterization of naturally derived materials for treatment of MI. Joseph, I need you to go over there and get the drink tickets and hand those out. Everybody gets two. And we're going to uh, get together uh, right across the little breezeway here in the Bella Vista Cafe and overlook the ocean and have some drinks and some snacks. And um, thank you so much. I'm going to send out an evaluation, and I look forward to hearing about what you think we should do something different next year to make this even better. Thank you again, everybody. Bye-bye. Oh, we still got shirts and stuff to give away, so <laughs> please stop by and see us.